Chaucer says he his clerk needed uh, 20 books to fill his shelf. Uh, it took 10 scribes to feed one, one uh, clerk. It's sort of a little like the agricultural revolution. It takes 10 farmers to feed one city folk. Then after the agricultural revolution, it's one farmer feeds 20 city folk. And it was the same sort of thing as far as scribes pr providing book provisions for friars and for laymen, lay professionals. In other words, it's an economy of scarcity uh, that you're dealing with. And people are starved, in a sense, for more books. On the other hand, it means they read very intensively what works they have. There, there, I came across uh, um, a comment of, let's see, it was in Oxford, where all the books on medicine and on um, theology had gone. The, the friars had taken them for their houses of studies. And so the professor there, the Don, didn't have any, any books to rely on. There's nothing new about saying that printing was important in the Reformation. What's interesting to me is, though, the way printing becomes an emancipatory force for the first time. I don't think the church thought of it as an emancip emancipating force until the split came with Luther, the Lutheran revolt, and the Lutherans saw it as a way of emancipating uh, the population from the hold of, the, of Rome, emancipating Germans from the domination of the Italian Pope, and so forth and so on. And this theme was then taken over by Protestants in other countries. And in England, of course, it was very much that printing was uh, a way of um, emancipating the English from under Hen after Henry the the Eighth uh, under Edward and so forth. So that for the first time, I think from the Reformation on, printing becomes associated with rebellion and. Um, emancipation. Then, then the church begins to change its position and becomes much more ambivalent about this wonderful and, and the Council of Trent creates the index of prohibited books and the, um, well, different, different institutions to control a technology that they had previously welcomed. So that the split is what creates a different attitude in many different regions toward printing. There's the governor of Virginia, uh, uh, Governor Berkeley, who wrote to his overseers in England in uh, the 17th century saying, thank God we have no printing in Virginia and we shall never have it as long as I'm governor. Uh, but of course they were using printed books in Virginia because they came from Maryland, they came from all over. He just didn't want the printing press there because he thought it was a source of heresy. And this was a reaction to the English Civil War and the pamphlet wars, and they were called paper bullets in that period. The pamphleteer is, is an interesting figure. Uh, there's no question. Uh, the pamphlet wars are something that you just don't, I mean, you get certain manifestos in the age of the scribe. There's no doubt about that, and uh, political documents, and so forth. But, uh, and you have, you have wars, <laughs> civil wars. Uh, you have the empire versus uh, the uh, church uh, in, in Germany. But uh, you don't have the kind of uh, continuous uh, arguments going on between uh, one faction and another that you have with these pamphlet wars where uh, the fallout does lead to people, which I say, converting to different, different causes. The big, the big cost is the reams of paper that you have to have in advance. And that's, that's the big uh, outlay. But the press itself is a small, 
small wooden press. You know, people used to put them on rafts and float down to another town if they were in trouble with the authorities. It, it was very movable, uh, a piece of movable property and a printing shop, depending on whether you have 10 presses or one press. There were printers that were almost holes in the wall or down in the, if they were printing uh, uh, subversive material, they could sort of hide their presses very quickly, keep the, the police. So, I mean, it, it, it's, an, it, it's a technology that involves large spaces and a lot of outlay or a very small operation, sort of a one-man thing. These things were operating in basements or attics or garrets or whatever you call them. The case of the Copernicus, uh, uh, Copernican uh, um, theory is a good one because the printers were the ones who were hunted down uh, if they printed the forbidden text. So uh, more than, than the, we think of persecuting the authors, but it was really the printers who, who suffered most. And it did sort of quiet, it, did, it, it succeeded to a certain extent, it seems to me, in dampening initiative in Catholic countries. In no European country that I can think of was there such a thing as a free press. But after the War of Dutch Independence, there were so many, uh, Holland did not have a state church, and there were so many different little provinces and uh, communities that you could actually take your press if you were in trouble in one community down to your cousin in another town and set up printing there. And they did. I mean, that's the way it... So they didn't have a free press as far as institutional controls went, but they had a free de facto press because institutional controls were not centralized. And that's a sort of miniature of Europe as a whole a Protestant Europe, whereas in Catholic Europe things worked pretty well centralized. The key example is the index of prohibited books, of course, the church making an effort to see that throughout Europe the uh, Catholic, uh, Catholics would not uh, print or sell or purchase <laughs> uh, anything on this list which, while the rich uh, patrons could manage to avoid through black market thing, ordinary people couldn't, and printers were prosecuted. And in fact, I have a case of one Dutch printer who p looked at the index of prohibited books and used it uh, for his publication program because he knew these were titles that would sell well. And uh, it's a ricochet, but it would only work as a ricochet if Europe was divided.